At this point right now, the people that are in this studio are the only people that have heard these songs. Our management hasn't heard them. Our label hasn't heard them. It's almost like we've been asleep this whole time in our perfect dream world where the only thing that exists is art. David, do you know, happen to know where the gaff tape ended up? It would be good if we could find some gaff tape. This beat and a black rose is... That's a good old chorus right there, bud. If you put headphones on, it might not be so brutal. I wouldn't call them personal goals because I try to, uh, there's a lot of heavy handed producers and I've been one of those in my career for sure. But over the last 10 or 15 years, I've really taken a different approach and I just try to be a reflection of what's inside the band. I try to help them pull that out and not make my record for them. Uh, I try to let them stand on their own talent. I'm not gonna over-talent somebody or under-talent somebody. I try to make it as great as it can be. And so I didn't have any personal goals, but I had some goals that I thought that they could reach within themselves. And one for Matt was to stretch a little more lyrically. It's become a little bit of a crutch for him to write about pain and sobriety. And that, I understand that because it's definitely easier to write a sad song than it is a happy song without it sounding cheesy. Or at least that's my experience. And I think it's Matt's too, but I think on this group of songs there's some hope. There's some darkness too, but there's some hope. It was nice to hear him tell a story. It was good. <laughs> and then for David, it was just to kind of settle. You know, David can be pretty high strung though he probably appears very jovial to people. I, there's, a, there's a tension in him that weighs on him. I mean, he's had a pretty rough year overall with his family. So for me, it was uh, it's really important for him to have fun and enjoy this process, because I think he takes on a lot because he likes to sit in the driver's seat and, you know, mess with the programming and mess with the samples and do a lot of the grunt work. I think he takes a lot on and I pushed really hard to let me drive when he can in here and stuff so that he can just enjoy being in a band. Because I'm not sure he's ever gotten to just enjoy being in a band, you know? 
drink a few extra beers and just have a good time. I think he's missing that right now, and I don't want him to miss it. I mean, we crushed the first seven days, and <clears throat> first three songs were came pretty quick, and this one has been a little bit of a battle. I'm taking a break on it, I guess. Yep. I don't know. I haven't given up on it yet, totally. Have you given up totally on it? No. The other three songs that we've done this week have been just good songs. Like if you take away all the instrumentation, you can play them on piano, and, and you just great. play yeah. piano and vocal, it's they're all three really solid songs. Mm -hmm. This one would be very difficult on just piano and vocal, yeah, and and resonate and hit really hard. Actually. Yes, you're right. And <laughs> I was gonna say, me. actually, shimmy, like, shimmy, shimmy with me. Yeah. <sighs> I know if we don't have something by the end of tonight, we're not gonna keep working on it. If you guys get frustrated and you want to bail, like that's kind of like your mo. It's happened on every song that got challenging on every record. But then we always finish it, and those become like your jams. Yeah. So I just know that if we just stick. Yeah. The plot on this one will finish it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, I think we could do something fun with a cowbell. What you had there wasn't right. We could probably do something fun with percussions in the chorus or the place where the rapper is or something. But beyond that, like, it feels pretty done. Like, it's gnarly. Yeah. I see. Let's go jam it. Yeah. I think we should just listen to it. Yeah, turn the lights down. Rock your dick. You know? <laughs> I think we should do the high vocal part on the verse. Second half of both verses. Yeah. Um, yeah. I liked when you were fucking with the tambourine a little bit in the yeah, chorus, maybe. It's, just, it's a terrible tambourine. Yeah. I agree. That's what I'm saying. There's probably some percussion in the chorus. I think I was struggling a lot with knowing what the song was. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, I didn't know what the song was. So I think I was working towards an unknown goal. It's like not a song, it's a banger. Mm -hmm. It's like a thing. Hearing it like that, it's a festival I get song. It. Right. I fucking yeah. get it. It's, and I, get I do what I want. I feel yeah. like a song. It's just a thing. It's KDV. Yes. Yeah. yeah. You're low key, so I don't. I can't read you right now. No, I like it. I think I'm gonna like it way better with a rapper on it for damn sure. Mm -hmm. I think I was approaching it earlier as still trying to be an alt song, which is why it wasn't working. Yeah. Right. It's not an alt song. That's the thing. <laughs> is that y'all. I mean, aside from Middle Fingers, you weren't a very alt band on the last record. Mm -hmm. Just the fact that we wrote three that are more alt already doesn't mean that suddenly that's just all you do. We can't think in terms of what works for what. You just have to do awesome shit yeah. that makes you want to fucking, you know, and we just move from there. Yeah, right? That, that, that nailed it on the head. It's one of the reasons why, we, why it's so nice having you is to remind us of that shit. Right. This is all fucking brand new to us, and no matter how much we convinced ourselves going into record two that we wouldn't feel any pressure from it, it's, it's turning out to be not true. Like, I do feel weird pressure. to the first record that we did, I was just ecstatic at the, at the possibilities and potential of the future, and I had never been a part of creating songs like that before. And at that point in time, we had really no management, no fan base. Um, we just did it for the love of the music, and this time it's changed a little bit because there's so many more things 
that have come into play since the last time we were in the studio. Obviously signing a major label deal and publishing deal and having big management now and actually having a fan base put on an, an amount of pressure that I didn't think that I was gonna struggle with because I kind of mentally prepped myself going into the studio this time to go. <clears throat> I realized that there's pressure, but there shouldn't be pressure. So I think I'm good. And then we started making songs and all I could think about was, is this group of people gonna like it? Is our management gonna like it? Will our publishers like it? Will the songs be synced? Will our fans think we're selling out? Like all these irrational things. And so it was a little bit more of a struggle for me to get into the right mental headspace for this round of songs. And I really kind of missed that kid-like quality um, creating this time around. And I'd say that affected me more so than I wanted it to. Their lives changed instantly with two contracts. And the fact is, is when you're a band like Missio, you know that whatever single the label chooses is going directly to Alt Nation. They're probably gonna play it and it's gonna be judged harshly or well immediately. It's gonna get millions of streams immediately and people all over are gonna go, what's Missio doing now? What, what is this shit? Or, I love it, they took a step forward. Everybody wants you to write a radio song or everyone wants you to write, write a song that is gonna be universally accepted as a hit. And even if you don't believe any of that stuff, after you're told that stuff so many times, it's hard to not at least think about the art you're creating through that filter and say like, oh, I wonder if this is gonna check the box for someone else. And that's just a bad game to get into. And, and I, I think we both underestimated like that pressure coming in. I mean, this last year was the craziest year of our lives, man. Please give a huge welcome to Missio. Touring on a, on a big level, playing in front of, you know, hundreds and thousands of people. We both had interesting personal years. Lots of experiences that were very weighty emotionally, but things that we had to figure out how to write about because they were new, you know? We had to think of, we had to, uh, took a second to get it all out, you know? Pause that for a second, because uh, I want you to add into some of this lyric stuff. For verse two, we're going to try chasing just the whole family dynamic, especially since it's me and the Black Roses. You're talking about this really mm -hmm. fucked up family portrait situation. Um, Is your old man still with the lady? Yeah. Really? Uh-huh. Moved with him to wherever they moved? I don't know if they're living together officially, but I, I don't, I mean... Oh, they Shit. have to be. They must be. I don't know. What do you, how do you, like, what? Well, I had the first line of the second verse. Ironically, that's why I asked if they were still together. I am your son, but she's not my mother. Oh, fuck. Let's do it. You know <laughs> what I mean? Because that's the things I've always had to explore am I'm amongst multiple marriages. So, it's like, in a way, I'm not going to listen to that lady. That's yeah. not my mom. So just, just, <laughs> from my perspective, this song loses a little bit of its weight when you go to the whole family. I feel like it should stay, stay on the, the son, on right? yeah. yeah, the 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 son parent relationship is a that's where I'm like in it. I was just doing that based off of what the chorus means. Yeah, but it can mean anything. That's just what it means to you. Well, the do you know course, what I mean? Like he may take it a some completely different way, and it's not a literal thing when you think about the fact that what is it? Seventy percent of marriages end up in divorce or some crazy shit. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's and most people's experience. Honestly, like, yeah. <laughs> most people's experience is trying to figure out a relationship with a new person in your parents' life. I I didn't speak to my dad for oh, no, almost a year. Yeah. And then when we first talked, I didn't say anything bad to him right you harbor a lot of resentment in parents and stuff and even when they fuck up but as they get older you start to feel this like i mean it's your fucking parent right mm -hmm. and even if they've let you down you don't want to like hurt their feelings so you'll be surprised you'll be sitting there thinking like i should tell this bitch to fuck off she fucked up with my mother yeah, but you won't you just won't 
what about I'm your son, she's not my mother, you think she's perfect, to me just another. Woo, I like it! Fuck yeah, let's just go. That's a great line, Matthew. Damn it! <laughs> the writing on the last record was totally different because it was stories that I had and experiences that I had um, with drug addiction and substance abuse and things like that. So coming out with that first record, it was a lot more raw and real. And again, it was, it was untattered by commerce. It was just, I have to say this, so I'm going to say it. And then you live a year in the commerce art world and you see what works and what doesn't. And using a word like fuck in a song makes it really hard to have that song pushed. So coming in this time, I definitely was a little bit more mindful of the things that we say in order for it to be used in different avenues. But it was actually a good thing because it challenged me to find a phrase or other words to use instead of an easy word like fuck. It actually, I mean, it sounds better with the fuck in it. And then yeah. no matter what you did, we did for clean versions, none of them were as cool as the word fuck. So then you're kind of like, well, shit. Yeah, well, it's like killing Darth Vader with my mother, mother kick drum. It's, yeah, it it's like, I, that's lame versus killing Darth Vader with motherfucking kick drum. That's why they call me Temple Priest, that's, motherfucker. That's why they, they call, call me Temple, Temple Priest, Priest, motherfucker. motherfucker. <laughs> it's the way you go. Fucker. 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 Just being frank, I don't really like their early stuff. The stuff that they did together, I it was very popular, and they do it very well. It's like this kind of dreamy, cigarossy stuff, and it's cool, and I get it, but it's not my, th I don't, I just don't have a lot of mental space for music like that. So uh, one of the early things with, with them when I s agreed to do a more mainstream sound for them was I wanted them to write a song to pitch for Britney Spears. Matt wrote the chorus of Middle Fingers for Britney Spears. But the, the fruitfulness of that exercise was actually he realized, oh, I can write a singable chorus and it still feels authentic to me. It's just really hard. So after that, it was like the light flipped on for him, like, oh, I have no boundaries. I can go anywhere, and it's always going to sound like me. I am your son. She's not my mother. You think she's perfect to me, just another, do you? Think, damn it. Do you think that it's OK? Think that's OK? Uh, one more time. Do you think? But that's okay. I am your son. You are my father. You led us like lambs on our way to the slaughter. Who do you think you are? I am your son. You are my mother. I am on my own. You are not my lover. Don't tell me how to live. I am your son. My father, you led us like clams on our way to the slaughter. Who do you think you are? I mean, look, man, when you have a subject to write about, like a real thing, lyrics are easy as hell. I'm sure it's just like writing a screenplay or something. It's like, if you have the idea, it's like, there it is. Okay, I, 
I can't believe I had the idea. There it is. Whereas sometimes you're just stabbing in the dark. Yeah, I don't know what you're talking about. You like a set of words that are cool and you don't know where to go with them. So, I mean, it's always great when someone actually has a real story that's really happening to them and you can talk about it. <laughs> I keep thinking of the worst shit. I'm just going to shit. Down, nope. Write it down. Nope. <laughs> nope. <laughs> People are dumb. But people can read through the bullshit that comes from artists. And I just get so tired of hearing songs, whether it's on Spotify or radio or whatever, and it's, it's about nothing. And again, that may be a little bit unfair for me or a little bit judgy because I don't know where that artist came from when they wrote that song. But I've been in writing sessions where those writers don't care a single bit about the lyrical content. It's just, let's get songs, let's get a paycheck, and let's go home. And I think that's bullshit. It has to come from a genuine place, otherwise people aren't going to resonate with it. That the chorus, that the last line, that it doesn't come across as cheesy, just because it is kind of kitschy, you know. The, the of, of we this are song. one. We are, we're a broken family. We're a broken family. That's my only concern. But what if we took it over the top and had a group of kids singing as well? It, it is like kind of a quirky chorus, and we were just wondering if it's on the line or if we should push it far over the line to kind of make it more of a satire. So how would you find kids? I know, that's what we're talking yeah. about. Yeah, <laughs> that would be the issue. But let's not think about that. Let's think about the song. Well, and we sort of have to think about that. That's not an easy thing to pull off, um, getting a bunch of kids around here. For me, in the studio, there are no bad ideas. I have to let pe people that are real artists, like Matt or David, people that are like true artists, chase ideas that I think are going to end up terrible. But if you let an artist go down the path of complete, I mean, like pure artistry, where you know, they probably even know, like, there's nothing we can do with this. But if you let them go down that path, they're more than happy to try the like ideas that'll help it push it a little more towards radio or whatever, because you've let them go and do whatever they want too. You know, it has to be a good balancing act, and you have to make them feel safe enough to do something like that where it's not like selling their souls. I mean, if you're asking me, I think it's great as is. Okay. If you're asking for my opinion, I think it's great as it sits. If you would like to try a bunch of kids. <laughs> You can't say it. <laughs> <laughs> if you would like to try a bunch of kids on some shit, fine with that. <laughs> You're gonna have to start finding them now. Only thing I'm worried about is the people who don't know Missio and they hear "We Are a Broken Family" with the melody of it. It is kind of kitschy. So. I mean, just to clarify then, we're trying, you're saying that you want to change the song because of you're worried about what other people may think about it. Yes. <laughs> well, when you put it like that. Yes. Yes. I guess what I'm saying yes, precisely. is, what do you think about it? <laughs> because that's all that's relevant to me. I mean, like, I think it's pretty rad. Bringing in a producer, it's hard to trust them because Essentially, they're being brought in to, in some cases, like their job is to kind of like balance the label requests versus these. And so it's easy to have an underlying uh, distrust of what a producer's motives are, especially because the good ones are all masters at, at manipulating a room. Like it's just part of the job. I mean, you have to be really good at that. But Dwight has proven over and over again to have our best interests at heart. Dwight should be an A-list producer. 
with his level of genius and what he does, but I think the only reason he's not is because that dude re refuses to play the game. That guy is an artist through and through, and he's taught me a lot about what art is and how you should approach it. He's not gonna let me put an idea out that's not good. And I think he sees the potential of what can be, and he's not gonna settle until that happens. So if it comes down to an idea that I think is good and it's actually terrible to have him go, dude, you can do better than that and you know you can. And I get really pissed off and I'm like, it's fucking good. He's like, come back to me when it's better. Uh, I can't, it's weird. I am you and you are me. I think it's I you're not hitting you. and. You're going, I, I am you. You're going, I am you. It's I am you and you are me. Can anybody uh, turn Dwight's mic off? Does Mike, does do I have a mic back there? Dude, I'm on the third fucking try. All right, go. Well, Matthew's such a loner, he doesn't like people talking to him at all. So it's sometimes hard to figure out what you should say and how much you should say and how much you should let a vocalist figure out on their own. Producing a vocalist is always difficult because they're all different, but Matthew, I mean, you felt it. Like, it was like a tangible difference when he started being in the moment, you know? The, pro the thing is, in my head, I'm thinking about the fact that you're not going to use any tune on it. Dude. So I'm trying to, it's like a very uh, difficult part to be pitch. Dude, here, here's the deal. You should never, don't think about that, ever. Dwight and I are going to take care of you. We're going to make sure it sounds great. All right. And you should never think about anything. Just think about singing and feeling whatever you're feeling and trust that we are going to make it sound great. All right. Okay. My least favorite part of this entire process is singing vocals. Why is that? Hold on, let me turn the vibrate off. <laughs> it's hard for me because I'm, I have to focus on pitch. I have to focus on the words. I have to, f I have to focus on the timing. I have to focus on getting into that character of what the lyrics are written about. So until I hear it back, once it's comped, I don't really know. Do you feel good about it? No. <laughs> Is so, it pitchy to you? <laughs> well, I can, nudge, I, I can nudge a couple things. It'll be fine. Right. But, but, oh, let's talk about understanding. You should kind of have a groove to it. But then on internet, but I hope as you would understand. To me, that's how that science naturally sings. So it's like, I hope you would understand. I hope you would understand. Just like flow it a little more. That's how I hear it. Let's try that. Let's do it. And then we'll just start over on the second verse. Those two guys trust each other seemingly to no end. Like there, se there doesn't seem to be ever a check on each other like i don't know man but they have the ability and the you know the boundaries within their relationship to be able to be like i'm not feeling that and the other guy just goes okay let's try something else uh with matthew the reason i trust him is because he just has an authenticity like when he says something that is right when he sings something that he believes in and is right it's really easy for me to tell that that's the way. And when he's seeing something that's wrong and it's not true to him, I can tell that too. Like we just know each other really well and I know why he's doing what he's doing and he knows why I'm doing what I'm doing. And I think we have that same vision. We want the same things and we struggle with the same things in some ways like, but I, I know he wants to make the best art and that's what he cares about. I don't know, I think he just he just gets me as a as a person. He doesn't judge me. I mean, he's literally walked through the end of my alcoholism. And um, when I met him, I never ever thought that we would have been friends, ever. And it's just so funny that the people that you least expect to actually be a foundation in your life are the ones that end up being that for you. 
I mean, he's got an amazing wife and who has taken me in as family as well. And we're on the same page musically. And I don't know, it's just, I don't know if there's anyone else that I think that this would work with except for David. And um, it's just so cool to see the passion that he has when, we, when we're when we done writing songs and we're just listening back. And, you know, I'm, I'm a very closed off person and, and don't like to share or show very much. And he doesn't care. It's just, I'm sitting in the back just listening and doing my thing and he's just, rocking away and um, I mean that passion is not something that I come across very often and that means more to me than anything else like I wish everybody on our team was in it for that exact reason how's your night man that was my night. Yeah. Sleep okay? Yeah, just about sleep. I don't, I don't slept well here. I'm worried about scorpions in my bed. <laughs> I'm worried about fucking spiders in my bed. Have you even seen yeah, a scorpion yet? No. There's, there's no validity to what I'm thinking. I'm just saying that's yeah. like, the desert has no rules. The unexpected. fans 50,000 records yeah but it started at, yeah, that's what I mean like it didn't go to number one it didn't blow everything away that didn't happen for middle fingers mm -hmm. and it didn't happen for deep blue sea two songs that everyone thought were pretty great contenders to do that right mm -hmm. but they didn't do it you know yeah. stars didn't align on them or whatever it's yeah. just like I said a lot of that's timing so what I'm saying is I don't think everything's dire I don't think they're over there going let's drop them but what I do think that they're now saying, okay, should we spend that much money this year? Uh, should we green light if we don't have to yet? Because I'm sure your record cycle's 15 months or something. So they probably have seven months to before they even have to say, yes, let's make another record. Like, I I think that we're, we're very worth keeping around for lots of artistic reasons. And like, I, I naively think that that, that, makes, that matters to them matters at, all. at right. all. And it's good to hear those because it's like, Especially going in, like... I mean, they do want to put out cool records. Yeah. But they also want them to sell a fuck yeah. ton of units. So, uh, so all I'm saying is, in terms of the bottom line, yeah, you guys are like the shitty band. You did not succeed in terms of the major label model. Yeah. You know? Commerce and art. It's a business of art where you're trying to sell it. It's always weird. <laughs> it's weird to sell art. Like we were talking about last night, like if you let yourself get into that mindset, you just aren't thankful, you're not, not you, but we, like, we need to be focusing on writing and enjoying the process and making our art. It's like a righteous anger. It's not an anger of like, fuck you guys. It's an, it's an anger of like, I see how passionate you are about your bands that are successful, but how did they, how did they become successful? Because a bunch of people who were passionate about them yeah. before they were successful made them well, that thing. And that's what I want from our team. You know, it, it's like, I'm, I'm just you, fucking passionate. Like, it's hard because it's just complicated. There's so many moving parts and no one is truly accountable for anything besides us, right? We're the only ones that really have to live and die with everything. Yeah. Everybody else can just move on to their other bands or whatever they want to do, but Whatever, dude. I don't really want to talk about this. <laughs> it just puts me in a bad mood, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think it should. I think it should motivate us to fucking get some shit together. The first year has been, we've learned a lot. 
not only just about life, but from the business side of things too. And I think coming off of record one, Matthew and I were able to look at our successes and our failures and, you know, what ways we can get better. You know, we're still doing a lot of things for the first time. And so figuring out what works and what doesn't. And look, it's like, again, there's no, there's no kind of skirting around the, the situation. Um, it, it's it's a tough mental challenge to know that you're creating art, which is absolutely 100% subjective. And you're gonna have to present it to people that are gonna essentially say whether they like it or not and how, if they think it has potential to be what they think, if it's good, you know? Well, it's something that we all signed up for when we signed the record deal. You are now, as a human, deciding that you're gonna mesh art and commerce together. And there are pros and there are cons to both. There are pros in that your music is now gonna be able to be pushed to places that you wouldn't have ever expected it to be. And oftentimes, the cons are that you now have people that are getting into your creative space telling you what they think should happen so that the commerce can succeed. And oftentimes the commerce doesn't really know what's gonna work, and oftentimes the artist doesn't know what's gonna work. Yeah, I mean, I understand where they're coming from. I'm an artist too. When, noth when your single isn't big and you know it's good, everyone gets the blame. Whoever is holding it back, it's an amalgam of people and, and, and when you're the artist. It's like a whole group of people in your brain. When, like I said, it's just kind of a crapshoot. You know, you can't make something a hit. It either kind of goes or it doesn't. You know, it finds its way or it doesn't. And you're going to start driving yourself crazy. And again, I just go back to you just have to do what you're good at. Your job is to make great songs that you love. That's why the team all signed on with you in the first place. It's because they love what you do. And they do see dollar signs in it. You have to keep presenting that material until something fucking slips through the cracks and becomes a big old worldwide hit. You know, Everybody Gets High does close to 20 million views on its own, and guess what? That didn't do shit, you know? But, yeah, anyway, we, I was just venting my frustrations, which... I mean, your fears are real. Are, yeah. That's the problem with major labels. You have to hope that their traffic is right, that they also believe that these are singles, like we do and that they open the purse strings and spend the money on one of them. The thing that makes it hard is you have to, you can't ever miss, you know what I mean? Like, the reason we didn't have a third single is because Deep Blue Sea didn't go to top 10. I had Deep Blue Sea gone top 10, we would have had, they would have said, shit, we ain't missing, let's keep going. Right. It's the first miss you have on a record, then the whole dead. record is dead. Yeah. And that's what makes it so fucking hard because... Well, that's because the, the, cause that, the way a major label works though is the way the finances are handled and the way the art is handled yeah. are actually two separate things. And the money department can basically tell the artistic department like, yeah, they are you're out of money, church, yeah. sorry. Yeah. You know, and uh, it's a big fight to beat that statement when it comes down. I mean, over the course of two weeks, a lot of stuff happens in the world of Missio. And that, that struggle became part of the authenticity that I think comes through, like, in the record and the music. Like, us struggling with that became a story in and of itself. But all of a sudden, your goal is no longer making art that you think is good but making art that you want someone else to think is good. And that simple concept is enough to totally melt your mind. Because just knowing that your career depends on what other people think of your music, it's easy to second guess yourself. I really don't wanna care what people think of the music and or myself and anything that I, that I do. But for the first time in my life, I've actually had money to where I, I'm okay paying my bills and, and pretty much doing whatever I want as a single 25-year-old guy. And that came from the success of 
songs and being signed. And then you think about, well, what if I don't have that? I, I hated being poor. I hated living month to month worrying about how I was going to get my next paycheck and not being able to pay off my debt that I had from credit cards and student loans, and that, that stuff sucks. What if my music is never successful like this first record was, and it can get scary because now it's me going, what art can we create that's going to make the most amount of money? Not, what's the art that we can make that's going to fulfill us the most? Two different things. And I never want to be somebody who continues to wrestle with wanting to make art for the sake of making money. And honestly, I don't think that I'm capable of putting out something that I'm not going to back. I wouldn't do it. But it really helps to have two other guys that are genuinely pushing me towards making the best art possible for myself, not for anybody else. So yeah, that's something that I just kind of realized is like the foundation of all my anxiety, I think, comes from wanting to maintain the lifestyle that I think that I should have. And that's kind of bullshit. I don't know what more ammunition we could have given them. I mean, literally, we are a great festival band that crushed every festival they booked. We got rave reviews every single time. We go out, we play shows, we sold out 80% of our headline tour. Every club we went into gave us rave reviews. We, they loved working with us. We had a top 10 radio single, as well as three number ones on All Nation. We did not give them a half-loaded gun. We gave them a motherfucking Uzi, man, and they did not, they didn't fucking do it as far as I'm concerned. And that's not how I want Missy to run. But obviously, you guys haven't heard the songs, you haven't heard what we're doing, you won't, you're not inside our heads, but Matthew and I know what we're doing right now, and we see the future, and we don't want average for the next record. Like, what bridge are we going to be burning then at this point by switching agencies? Why? To me, this is just a normal business decision that, like, keep saying we're going to be burning these bridges, but how are we burning a bridge? I don't know if it's ever just all good. Just like this. This is a dream. And we're still doing great shit, but I literally woke up this morning and I couldn't move. <laughs> and I've been like working my body out for like two hours just to be able to like move. But I don't know. I don't know what to do either. It's like we still have like 11 or 12 days left here in the studio and I'm still fully mentally like so many more ideas that I want to get to. and. The way I work best is in front of the computer, kind of at the controls. Um, that's kind of what I bring to Missio in a lot of ways. That's like the main thing I do. And I'm a very expressive physically. Like I like to move and jump, and that's how I listen to music on stage and when I'm by myself, and especially when I'm making music. And like, it's physically hurting my ability to do the one thing that I'm really good at doing. It's just like literally preventing me from doing my job that I like have spent my whole life working on. And, and I don't want, like, I don't know. Like, this isn't just how I, I wanted it to go, you know? <laughs> I have like a plan of what I thought it was gonna be like that I've probably been thinking about since I was a little kid. <laughs> and, and this just isn't exactly what it, it was supposed to be like to me, and I think that's letting me down. Do you think it's stress with everything that's been going on? I don't know. I don't know what, what's causing this, but it's just like, I don't know how to handle it either. Maybe it'll get better.
I just want everyone to enjoy the process and have a good memory of making their record because the fact is, is that most records fail miserably, like horribly, horribly badly. Even records with tons of money behind them and a big label and everything like that, they usually do quite badly. So I like to have people enjoy the process of it because that's usually all they have to take from it in the end, you know? Their money's gone, the labels drop them, and all they have is their memories of making those, you know, those things that come out on vinyl or <laughs> digital Spotify now or whatever, and I want them to remember that fondly. I just, I always say, if you're gonna fail, you might as well fail at something you love. You might as well fail behind a record that you think is the shit. And my whole thought process on all of that stuff was greatly shaken by an artist I've done seven records with, his name's Bob Schneider. And we were talking, and at the time I was a writer for Sony, where I felt like everything I wrote was for a number, uh, and I just sent it up to flagpole, like hope it gets cut so I can make some money, which is just gross. And so I had this conversation with Bob where I was like, I'm really unhappy. It was a late night conversation with him. He goes, well, what are you miserable about? I go, man, I just, after this, I got to write that stuff for this American Idol kids, and, and then I got to do some pitches for this Faith Hill record, and I don't want to do any of that. And he goes, then don't. And I was like, well, what do you mean? He's like, don't do it. He goes, why would you be a musician or a mixer or a producer or an artist and not do exactly what you want to do? Why would you do anything but that? If you got into this business and you're like doing things that other people want you to do, you're doing it wrong. And I was like, oh, totally. And so the pressure of a second record comes with all these like, well, I hope I please my label so they give me another check. And I hope I please my fans so that they continue to come. But actually, your fans want you to do what you want to do. They want you to say what you need to say. They want you to record what you need to record. And the real fans are gonna love it. And if they don't, at least, again, you failed on something that you think is great. David has been having a really difficult time coming home and trying to readjust to life with his wife 
and vice versa. She's having a very difficult time as well. And I care about Amanda, obviously not as much as David, but they have become such an integrated part of my life and my growth that when he is, is sad or thinking about Amanda viewing it that way, I'm viewing it for them both. And I'm just like, God, I love these people so, so much. And it was such a cool moment that Dwight and I could be a part of that, I want to say, mental awakening for him by writing lyrics. And the lyric is, do you, do you still need me like you used to? Do you, do you still love me like you used to? And he was thinking in that moment after we wrote the lyrics about, holy shit, I think that's what Amanda thinks. What I was mentioning scares me the most is that I feel like so much of what has happened in the last year has like kind of changed me. Right. And like it genuinely scares me that she might not like who I've become. Right. This is my dream taking over our lives, you know, and like she didn't. I mean, but she's she, being supportive and saying like she chose. She understood this was going to happen. No, she didn't. Like. I, I don't mean, really believe it's gonna. She happen didn't really me. know. But that's why. But think I mean, I understand what she's saying when she says that. This is the most common thing in the world for yeah. musicians to go through, is because yeah. no, no, no one who marries them actually thinks it's gonna work, yeah. and you're actually gonna be gone all the time. Like, there is no easy way to come back home when you've been gone for a month and longer. Mm -hmm. There is two weeks, no fucking problem. Three weeks, dude. no fucking problem. Month and longer, shit is weird, dude. dude. I'm single and it's still hard to yeah. reintegrate yeah. back into everyday life. It's mm -hmm. not normal on tour. It's, it's, it's not. It's, it's not hard. normal. Yeah. But I'd love to try to find a way to have the sentiment of. But, I mean, it's gonna be weird either way. I want to do it with you. You yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Sorry, bud. <laughs> That's good though. Do you, do you still love me like you used to? Do you, do you, do you? Do you, do you still need me like you used to? Do you, do you, do you? We are not Less vibrato at the top of that chorus as your gang. To be honest, out here, you can't even hear it. Okay, good. Like, it's gonna be it's, tough. It's, okay, good. Yeah, the gangs aren't gonna be like super loud. Yeah, They're just okay. kind of adding the party a little bit. Yeah, lifting. I mean, have you guys struggled with the same shit? Kevin and I go to couples counseling, so I mm. like that really has made a difference. Yeah. There's just more consistency. Like, we talk about yeah. whatever, like, whatever's needed. There's no. I don't know, we have like, we hold way less back now and it's... That's definitely a theme of this record, yeah. going to get counseling. This <laughs> is a good, uh, that's a good takeaway for me that I should probably make happen. You know, we've been married since 2013 and uh, for the most part, even though I've been making records, we've been together in this last year and a half has been the first time where I've just been away. Not only just away physically, but there's been times where I've been away just mentally and emotionally in that I've just been distant and we both feel ourselves changing so much and I think people that have been in long-term relationships there's there's this weird feeling when you notice that your partner's changing and you know people have told us like you know you're with the same person the rest of your life since you've been married and after this year it was like I don't know I like I think you're with a different person every year. Like, I think everybody's always changing. Yeah, they don't always, maybe people don't change ultimately, but life changes, your circumstances changes, and your responses to certain things change. And, and we definitely have both grown and, and changed a lot this year. And that song, Do You, is about, it's just about overcoming that bit of separation and that feeling of being lost 
even lost with someone you know. If I'm, if I'm being completely honest with you, what is concerning to me is, I've said it already, but we have a call, we talk about everything, yada, 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 we come to a conclusion, and I feel like this is all politics-based because you have to play the game a little bit, but what it feels like is we're not discussing and thinking about, like, what ultimately what's going to be the best result for Missio? I feel like we are just doing an uphill battle constantly with decisions. Like I just don't feel like we're ever on the same page. And when we do get on the same page, everything gets flipped on its head, which I get some of that is just part of business and shit comes up and happens and changes things. But we're in the studio right now and it's like having to deal with with big decisions and like it's it's just like taking us out of the zone completely but I feel like we're dealing with this all the time where we're on tour and we're trying to figure something out and we don't agree and blah blah blah, blah. so I guess the first question that we have is like we feel this way do you feel this way are do you like working with us are you happy because I feel like if we can't figure this out, it's just not going to be a good fit a year from now if we continue to just keep doing shit like this. Sometimes there's a, a tendency to assume that the artists should do the music and the business people should do the business. And there's a lot of artists that that works really well for them. But Matthew and I are an extreme example of the opposite direction. And essentially, the issues that we have are when people go off and make creative decisions without us. And I think it's shortchanging for artists to not have their hands in everything. And so Matthew and I have started kind of trying to set our team up now in a way where creatively the business is still driven by our creative. Um, and so that's definitely been a difficult process that we've had to go through. It, it's really putting a lot of people in uncomfortable situations, including ourselves. And so, yeah, we had an issue um, this session. Let, we'll, we'll give it the day. We'll think about it for the day. And we'll let you know something tonight. Bye. Oh, I feel so weird. <laughs> I feel like I'm learning a lot about myself in a weird way over the last year and, and even now too. And it's just like our lifestyles have changed so much that, that it's really difficult to have people that understand the place that I am in my life because they don't know what touring is like. They don't know the pressures that David and I feel on a nightly basis to ensure that our fans are getting the best experience possible. So there's that change, but then there's also this mental change, which has been interesting to me because I've reached a lot of goals this year and they haven't lived up to what I thought that they would be. And that's been really frustrating for me because I was looking to these things to fill some voids that I have and they haven't done that. And so now I'm wrestling with, okay, well, what's next? Because all those things don't fill voids at all. If anything, they just make life a lot more difficult. Like, wh what's the most insane mess that you've ever woken up in and been like, what the fuck am I doing? You know, and to me, we should describe that moment. When I woke up with vomit all over my chest in a gorilla costume at Taylor Bartholomew's house. Yeah. <laughs> with books stacked on top of me. Dude, how about the time you came home and you're like, why are my clothes wet? Like, yeah. and why are, how did, where did my shoes go? Oh, you mean after I came home from jail? <laughs> Remember when I found your shirt on the counter, just <laughs> yeah. soaking wet. It was just drenched and I was like, 
Matthew, how did, what happened? You know, like. Couldn't tell you. <laughs> that's what, I'm, that's what the verse, Can't that, tell that you. like a conglomeration of all those thoughts is kind of what the verse needs to be. Okay. Yeah. Chorus. Rad drugs. New song. Rad drugs. Renaming the session. <laughs> it's official. Don't touch them. Nah. Don't do drugs, kids. That's how we should end the song. I just want you to talk about where you've been, like where you've been since our last interview, and tell me what happened exactly. And you can be, you can go as deep down that hole and be as honest as you want, um, and just see where that takes you. But I'm not gonna interrupt you. Mm -hmm. um, well, to put it frankly, I lied to a lot of people for a really long time. Um, I can't remember the last time that I've been sober. I mean, I've gone little spurts of time like on tour and things like that, but consistently from the overall view, I, I can't remember the last time I've actually been sober, despite what I tell people. And part of that comes from what I said earlier about being a master manipulator and that thing being attached to addiction. But I've just lied and lied and lied and lied and lied and lied to tons of people. And I think it's, um, I don't know, how do I? It's frustrating for me because I don't want to be a liar. Um, but it feels like struggling with addiction and whatever it is, is kind of like a, like, like a lifesaver for me. I feel like that's the one thing that I have to hold on to in a really t twisted, weird way. So fast forward to doing the Skeletons videos and being honest with our fans about how good it is to share your struggles with people. And here I am all the while not taking my own advice, internalizing everything, continuing to drink, showing up to those interviews at 10.30 a.m. already drunk because I didn't want to do the interview without having that as my comfort blanket. And all these people are sending me messages about, man, you, that interview saved my life and I'm clean and all this stuff. And now I have this whole different set of pressures because I've been fucking lying the entire time. I've been drinking every night. I've been hiding it from David. I've been hiding it from Dwight. Fast forward again, we go to El Paso in January. I decide that it would be a good idea to be creative while getting drunk secretly and hiding beer in my coffee pot or my coffee mug and going to the bathroom and chugging three beers at a time. And then fast forward from there, we go on tour. I do well on tour because I have people around me all the time who look out for me. And then I get back home and I one night get fucked up, like fucked up. And I'm laying in my bed and I'm just like, what am I doing? And I had this thought in that moment where I thought to myself, I think killing myself would be really good. Like it would be a really good option for me. And I thought about it way too long. And I guess something just clicked then that was finally saw the magnitude of what 
being fucked up does. So it's just this, it's just this cycle of like not giving a fuck about anything because I'm just trying to wrap my head around all that is going on in my life right now and I, I don't feel like I'm even close to grasping it if that makes any sense whatsoever. Do you agree that uh, we could use some more fun? Because the first record is so goddamn ser it's serious, except for yeah, KDV. It's, it's you know, it's a serious fucking record, and it's fun. I like the idea of I like having fun. Which then brings me to this point: Why are we doing this ballad? I would like a damn good reason why we're doing this ballad. Why we're spending any time on it at all? And what benefit does it bring to either the record or your live show? Well, that is a good point. Uh, I mean, <laughs> when we talked about it, it was it was before we had all these songs, mm -hmm. and it was I know it was going in the route of darker the weather, black rose of dart. I know songs and stuff like that. So, I mean, I'm gonna do that song eventually, whether it's from yeah. Missio or not. I also know that. Yeah. In terms of creating Missio songs, I 100% do not think we're wasting our time. When we're talking about creating That's songs... That's probably a poor choice of words. I don't mean like, well, well, no. that song has no value. Well, I, hold on, let me finish. Let me, I agree with you. are talking about actual physical time. I know, but we're here to work on this record, and I think I can agree that that song might not fit on this record. Yeah, I, I don't want to... I don't want to put a song on here that's going to make it not cohesive in a weird way. So. I mean, I don't mind wild cards just so we are clear. I don't mind like a song on a record that you're like that doesn't make any sense. Like, what I just mean about. is is like I want to just occupy the rest of the space with some fun stuff. It's a really important part of you guys that I don't think was reflected enough in the first record. Yeah, yeah. You're actually funny goofy guys and if everything's fucking serious all the time, it's it's not really a hundred percent who you are. Mm -hmm. I mean, look, I love the quiet stuff, but you start to feel like as you make records, like there's not even a place, like there's a place for it on the record, but we're probably not going to play it live and it's not going to make an impact. So like, why even waste the slot? And I think there's probably a little bit of that with them. Like, you know, getting the machine up and running and getting everything going always comes down to songs that people think are easily digestible and a little more relatable. Because if Matt had his way, he would just do a weird EDM record that had no vocals on it. So what I try to do is I put the songs with them into two batches. There's the uh, Matt songs, is what I call them, which only Matt and their fans will love. And then there's all the songs that you can sing along to, which Matt and David eventually love but the label and everyone will get right away. Just trying to make sure Matt doesn't blow up his career too much, you know? Because I've just seen this story a gazillion times and we'll turn in 20 songs and they'll go, eh, I mean, maybe there's half of a record here. Maybe there's part of a record, but we still need the singles. We need to go in with hit maker of the day guy and make some songs or we're, we, we're not putting this out. You need to keep writing the whole, I call it a writing circle. You can't get out of it. Oh, write some more songs. Oh, write, just write some more songs. But the fact is, is that no one knows 
what the song is at all. looking at our business and looking at from our perspective it, it was not a good year for us as good a year as it could have been um, and we feel like the music we're writing on the second record is going to be even bigger and have even more potential and this is the moment when we have to get it right and we can't be weak on that stuff you know if there's a way for communication to change in whatever way that is then yeah we'll think about it but as of now, I feel like our communication is fucking horrible. This is not, it's not gonna work. I can't function as a human like Dude, this. I can't have this much stress every fucking week over some stupid ass decision, especially when I'm in here making fucking our next record. Who knows how many decisions we've made based on false information because we haven't gotten the right fucking information. How long are we willing to accept that this is how we're just gonna communicate? It's not, this isn't normal. Communication, I think, short sells it. It just comes down to trust. Our decision process used to look like me literally walking down the hall of our house, knocking on his door, saying, hey, what do you think we release this? And we just do it. And now, you know, there's not just a manager, we have a management team. We have a label, we've got all of their people, we've got our publicists, we've got our whole team of booking agents, and your head spins. You, now, what used to be a trip down the hallway or a knock on the door is a, is a conference call in six time zones. And you, you see things and you think, that's probably why that person is saying that. That's probably why they're saying that. And then you, you, you start doing these things and you tie them all together and you don't trust anybody. You don't trust anybody. We should be on the same page about every decision that we, every giant decision that we made. Dude, the, and you fucking backpedal every time. Dude, I don't have to have somebody that agrees with us. I just have to have somebody that can go and execute whatever collective vision that we come up to together. Whatever's decided on, I want someone that's going to go ride or die with that and is willing to risk it all on. Clearly our communication is not good and we just, we need, we need to figure out whether this is really Right now, just... Whether this is really a viable fit. Despite the bullshit that comes along with it all, I love what I do. I love coming into the studio all day and writing songs. I love being on the road. I love meeting awesome fans. I love every aspect of it. But I don't have college degree, I don't have a plan B, this is the only plan that I have. And I don't want to see it fucked up because someone wasn't as passionate as David and I are. You're going to have to not bring your ego for this conversation to work. That's what I would say. Like, you're going to have to come as a person and a friend to talk through this. It's your business, you got to do what the fuck you want to do. I just know what kind of headache that is too. So. If you can salvage it and get it on good footing, I think it's better to play at least this cycle out that way. If you cannot, with this conversation, you probably should do what you want, you know, what you're saying you want to do, which is move on. I've never made a band do anything artistically. They go as far as they want to go towards the line, and the line for me is always commercial. And Missio has a line that they won't go over. But if a band is delivering good songs to you, and they love them, maybe don't spend a million dollars, maybe spend less. This doesn't make any sense to me when you can have a really successful band who no one knows who they are except the people that do. I'm fully expecting you to tell us that. Yeah. Okay. Before you hit call, like, okay. Well, I guess it's just, that's just what it is. <laughs> I guess this is happening then. 
Essentially, the only thing that separates any artist from any artist is the choices they make. And sometimes it's really hard to know what the right choice is. And there's no one you can turn to that, that's gonna make it for you. It's only you. I spent a lot of my life doing it someone else's way. And for us, this moment was a, a check-in time with everybody to say, are you sure you wanna do it our way? Because this is our way. And if it's not cool, you should let us know now because this is the way it's gonna be going forward. I, I want to have people on our team that are going to go out and execute our vision. And there may be times when we wanna do stuff that doesn't make sense to the normal business or the normal way things are going and I want to have a team that is at least willing to execute those things and do things our way. So where we're at right now is do we want to work this out with you and do you want to like try to figure out a different way of breaking this down and reapproaching our relationship because the way it's currently going is not a happy place for us. Like we spend a lot of time in the way we're running our movies one part of this is very different. The way it runs for so good. I have no idea why we both feel so like I don't like I don't know it's actually going on. Matthew and I only feel included in a lot of the decision making. I mean like we aren't making you as much money as another way for communication. That's a business. You're not angry, I'm not frustrated, I'm just trying to call a spade a spade. Like, how many times are we going to have to be like, well, if I did this, it's tired of like, always having a second guess where everyone's at and what's actually reality. You haven't heard the song, you haven't heard what we're doing, you're not out of your head. Know, but like the vision, and I know what this is going to be. If you think we're making a terrible mistake, like, I don't, I don't know. what this session felt like to me was family. And, you know, that was one of the first things Dwight talked about when I, when I first told him about everything that was going on in my life. I remember we had just uh, had lunch together in Austin and I would kind of told him, you know, I, it was real fresh and he's like, dude, you know, like your family is bigger than your family. Yeah, there's blood family, but then there's also the people that you do life with every day people like me, you got people like Matthew, and it's like, your family's not gone just because your parents aren't together anymore, you know? I learned a couple lessons. One of them being to not take for granted what it is that we get to do on a daily basis with art being our job. You know, this whole experience, a lot of the time I've just been bitching about the things that aren't going my way, and you sit on a water tower in the middle of a desert and watch the sunset, and you just realize how blessed you actually are. Like, I'm out here making a record, and that's my job, is to just make music for people. That's insane. So... It, it, was, it made me think to myself, man, I need to be a lot more grateful just for where we're at. These problems are good problems to have that you have to fight with your major label who gave you major amounts of money to do your art. That's a huge blessing. And two, I would say to remember why it is that I create music. There was this one moment where it was like probably 1.30 a.m. and everyone was in bed and we were just listening to songs and he was, maybe he was editing something, but he was sitting at the computer and um, and he's working on something and he's just, it was so weird. He had like this weird, this weird grin that he was doing and uh, I, this sounds so weird. I just was looking at him for like three minutes. And it was the first time that um, he kind of... <sighs> it was like the first time that 
he, uh, it was like this guy's my family, you know? And uh, I don't, I don't know, it's just, <clears throat> it's really special what he and I have, I don't know. He just, uh, he's a good dude that loves music. <clears throat> and I'm really, really grateful to have him. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> I guess from my own experience, you know, I spent most of my young life on the road from the age of about 20 to 30. And uh, there weren't videos and stuff to look back on um, like we have now. You don't have, no one had a cell, the cell phones didn't exist when I was 20, so. So all you had was your memories, but I was so always busy looking for the next gig, even at whatever tour I was on, I was always looking for the next tour and that I forgot to enjoy it uh, and I don't have a great memory in terms of stuff like that so a lot of it's just not there anymore. If I had been able to relax through that some and just accept the good and the bad days and the shows where there's people and the shows where there's not as the same thing, as the same goal, that I would have better memories and like a better perspective on that part of my life too. So. My whole long-winded point of that is I don't want them to, to miss out on the good part of all this, which is you, unlike 98% of the rest of the world, have already achieved your dreams, like you did it. Like you can fail from here and know that you did it, you know? Because no matter what they say, they're, they're, no one's goal is ever to be the, they're the biggest band in the world when they're a kid. It's just to like get to where they are where someone listens to the music you record and puts it out with you and helps you be creative and funds that. That's the goal when you're a kid, musician playing in your room, and they did it, you know? That's a cool last thing, and I just don't want them to forget it. Again, most records fail, so I just want to have a good time doing it because this is a really fun job. There's a lot of BS that comes with it. The industry can just be exhausting. It's so stupid. And it's decision making and, you know, but all that said, it's a great job. And I just try to remind people that, especially people that have been on the road for a year straight and they're tired. Um, they've been pushed around by their label a little at this point and they're starting to feel like, oh, remember all those things I read about people, you know, hating their label or whatever? Oh, like, I, I don't hate my label, but I get it. Like, I get where they're coming from. It's frustrating as hell to mix art and commerce. So I try to show them, and any band I work with, that this is still, it's a job, but it's the best job, you know? And you have to enjoy the ride. <laughs> 